If you like big mountains, epic light, landscape photography and post-processing tricks, stay tuned to this video because I want you to join me with some friends as we hike up a mountain, camp there for the night and then capture an amazing sunrise overlooking the Southern Alps here in New Zealand. And at the end of the video, I'll pull up the raw files and I'll show you how I put together this handheld focus stacked image at sunrise. Okay, let's go. Hopefully this is worth it. <laughs> We're getting there. Two hours of just up, up, up. And looking at the topo, any minute now, hopefully we get a few little clearings up here where it flattens out. That'll allow us somewhere to pitch the tents. And then look down the valley to the west. <laughs> look at that S curve. Yo, woo, woo. Wow. That's all we're here for. We just need the mountain to come out. Hopefully tomorrow morning. sunrise angle it's facing west obviously clouded in this afternoon which was expected so now looking back to the east got some epic light on the mountain there so we'll just go down try to pick up some of the plants for some color in the foreground got the river braids in the mid-ground and then the peak in the back with that light got to be quick it's got that last light up there now eh It's uh, 8 p.m. Boy, like some water. I'll have a meal and a bit of a chat with the boys. Try and get some sleep. It's going to be rough with this wind, but it makes it more memorable. Living. Show us the slop. <laughs> you you can't there, complain mate. up here. Yeah, I'm right. the rough night. <laughs> so what time did we finally fall asleep mate? It was probably 1.30. <laughs> yeah I'd say about 1.30 in the morning we took a break. The wind took a break and we finally got a chance to fall asleep. But look at that.
makes it more spectacular. That it was clouded over yesterday, it just takes your breath away now. You can see exactly why we're here, look at that. Some high cloud up there too. Hopefully that doesn't evaporate and that'll catch some of the light. We've got about 15 minutes until the actual sun will hit the peak really. So now is the part of just finding the frame, the composition. This is what interests me, some of the color. Pick up some plant life and then it just speaks for itself. The eskers of the river down Sefton. The sky is starting to light up. to the cause. Oh, so good. Lost for words, guys. What a morning. Okay, so we're back in the office now, and it has been a few weeks since the trip, and to be honest, that's when I really like to look at the raw files. If you have a great time out in the field, really memorable experience, and then you go and look at those files straight away, you're probably gonna be let down nine times out of 10. At least that's my experience anyway, because nothing can rival being there in that moment. And when you pull up the raws, it's most often just gonna kinda leave you feeling a little bit flat. And if you give it time, before you pull them up, you've given time for that emotion to fade and you can look at the raw files way more objectively. Anyway, enough of that. What I've done, I've pulled up some files here and this is a focus stack and this is kind of, you know, the main image that I'm gonna be going with. Um, I always like to, to layer up my images, starting with something wide and then have that narrowed down and that creates a sense of depth. And that's why I'll often have a foreground. It's a very common thing to do. Um, we're creating a linear perspective where we get something large that flows and gets narrower and narrower. Um, this raw file here that I've got, it looks so flat, doesn't it? It's really not doing justice to the light and the whole scene in general. So as you can see, this is a focus stack, meaning the first frame was shot focusing right on the foreground, right down there, and then progressively the focus just flows through to the background. That way I'm getting an infinite depth of field, and you're doing that when you can't achieve that with a narrow aperture. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to process one and then sync the settings across. So how would I process and approach a file like this? I begin with the real basics first and foremost. I'll adjust the color profile to landscape and then I'm just going to straighten the image up. It's slightly out and pretty rare for me to crop but I'm actually going to crop in slightly. I just feel like I probably don't need that much foreground. And I like the balance of the peaks back here. So I'm tidying those up so they're more centralized in the frame. I'm applying that crop. The next thing I'm gonna do, I always like to approach the dynamic range, the light. And at the moment, we've got a lot of darks, some mid-tones here, the brights, but then nothing too bright after that. I'm gonna initially just raise up the shadows globally so I can just see what's going on there. And then I'm gonna pull the highlights down partially so I can reveal more of that sky. The next thing I'm going to do is push K for an adjustment brush. If you haven't seen this tool before, check out some of my earlier videos where I really go in depth on how I use the brush, but it's pretty straightforward. So on the brush now, I'm just further bringing down exposure and highlights, and that's to darken that upper part of the sky, doing this in order to push the eye towards the center of the frame. Now, straight away, I'm going to jump in and work on the vibrance and saturation and then some color grading. This image to me, it's all about those beautiful warm hues contrasted with the cool tones. So we have cool tones in the lake, in the shadows of the mountain and even part of the sky. And then we have the warmth on the light on the peak and those clouds. Um, so what I wanna do is just close the light tab, open up the color tab. I'm gonna initially bring down the temperature. I really wanna lean into those cool tones. I think that just looks beautiful all in the hill here. 
obviously the lake and the river is all going to bring those to the left. This is global, meaning everything gets this adjustment. And then actually add some more magenta. I really think the color mix that we have going on here is just beautiful. The, the warm with the cool, very um, common formula, cool and warm, that color contrast just is very pleasing. You notice that it's soft back there, that's because the frame I'm on, the focus stack is probably more shot for the mid-ground, I dare say, or even there, there on the foreground. I just ignore that when I'm putting these together. I'm going to also increase the vibrance overall and then partially some of the saturation, just really bringing out the best of the color that we captured. I'm also going to jump back in, and yeah, I was quite crooked on this one, so let's just dial that in there, like so. The next thing I'll do now with my adjustment brush is to start to create some depth and separation through this tonal adjustment, bringing up the shadows and blacks and making sure that as we progress into the distance, the tonal range decreases. So the blacks, the deep tones essentially just get lighter and lighter and that's just re reflecting nature. It's exactly how things work out there. I'm got new brush this time, just same thing, but maybe not as heavy here in the mid-ground, like so. For the foreground, sometimes I'll do the opposite. It's already quite dark and contrasted, so I'm not gonna make it any darker, but I'll, I'll bring up whites and highlights, and that'll just lift anything that has a gentle amount of luminosity in there. That way we're seeing the details in the foreground, but they're not screaming at us and detracting from the background. With this brush, I'm gonna do some highlights and whites and just give a nice punch of light in that middle area and you'll see as I increase that like so. You'll notice I'm not making the brush tiny, that's completely on purpose so it looks more natural, especially with the high feather here. I'm not zooming right in and trying to make these fine tune adjustments, I'm letting it just flow out across the entire area so everything's coming up evenly. Now let's just jump into the color grading and what I'm really going to do is just warm those highlights and that will emphasize that light up on the mountain, you can see that happening there as we do that. And I think the key on this image is cooling the mid-tones. I think that's just going to give us that beautiful contrast. The cool and warm, potentially cooling the shadows as well. Something like that. Now for the focus stack itself, I'm not going to do that on this video. If you haven't seen focus, focus stacking before, just check out the rest of my channel. I have a video dedicated to this, how to focus stack. And I'll show you from start to finish how to blend it all together. Not going to spend time on that now. Let's just do a before and after. So that's where the raw was, that's where it's at. Already for me, this is getting to that point where I let it marinate, let it sit and then come back later with that fine tuning and just you know tweak everything that we've done here. But you can see already that really gets us in the ballpark. What I do now, the final part of the equation is sync those settings across all the raw files. So I just simply click the one that we worked on I say select all, so they're no, now all active, and then I say sync settings. What do we want to sync? Everything. So we check all, push OK, and then watch the thumbnails down the bottom, bang. They've all just had the application applied. And then from here, it's just a matter of opening in Photoshop and then finishing the stack. After the stack's complete, I'd go ahead and make those final adjustments. One of the final things I want to talk about in regards to composition is something called the linear perspective. The linear perspective is essentially where we're showcasing something going from being large and then narrowing down generally to a vanishing point. Um, and this is used in visual art as a way to create a sense of depth because we have that wide to narrow. I'll demonstrate it here first and foremost just on a blank document the way it works. Now it can happen with shapes and particularly lines but in regards to shapes if I was going to draw let's pretend this is a stone and I wanted to showcase that stone rolling off into the distance well you know what would happen next the following stones would obviously become smaller and smaller and smaller so we have that illusion of three-dimensionality on a 2D space and you can envision this perfectly with lines um, you know imagine standing on a pier, for example, a jetty that goes off into the distance, you'd have those lines just getting smaller as they fade off into the distance. And then closer to the viewer, obviously, it's going to be wider. So we have that 
again, three-dimensional illusion going on, and this is what you know any artist would use um, using a brush, a pen, a pencil, for example. When it comes to photography, we, we have to do that with our camera out in the field, purposely selecting a composition which is gonna help us create the linear perspective. Uh, that's why, particularly when I'm using a wide angle, I do like to somewhat get low and close to foreground matter because that's how we create that linear perspective. As you get low and close, that foreground matter stretches out and gets larger. Here's an example here. We have that linear perspective first and foremost on the rock in the foreground. See how wide it is, and then it's just floating on and getting smaller, so a big to small. We have that dramatically with the water that's flowing through the frame there, but then you'll see as it hooks around, it's getting smaller and smaller as it fades off into the distance. You're probably thinking, yeah, that happens all the time. You'll be surprised how easily you can mess this up because maybe you just stood up too high. So now we've lost that wide to narrow. If you get down too low, everything's gonna be wide. You're not gonna see that linear perspective. So a couple more examples here, this stone, quite large and slowly, very subtly tapering down, but also having that other stone in the background big to small floating through the frame. These waves, similar type thing going on. Let's have a look at another one here. This tree, so really close to it. So the details are heightened. And then that branch, as it gets through to the background, what's it doing? It's getting narrower. So the eye will flow through. There's a sense of depth right here as well, the river. So typically you might say, oh yeah, these are leading lines. Yes, they are leading lines, but you're using the leading lines in a way to showcase that linear perspective, the wide tapering down to narrow. I oft often like to also say, um, showcase the mid-ground. If we can see a mid-ground um, separated from the foreground, you'll typically have that big to small transition anyway because anything in that mid-ground is gonna be smaller because it is further away. So you're gonna create that, again, that three-dimensional look. So keep that in mind next time you're out in the field. Um, in the image here in this shoot, I didn't overdo it like I would in some of my other scenes, but I still made sure that I found just a few details to put in the front instead of just shooting off and getting the river and lake and the mountain in the back. I made sure that I got a few details in the front there to roll the eye through the frame and it's just something that I'll do in a lot of my work. Keep it in mind next time you're out shooting anyway. Thanks for viewing the uh, video today. If you have any questions at all, just let me know. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you in the next one soon. Cheers.